Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are still in Romans chapter 8, so if you have your Bibles with you, please go ahead and open them up. And we're going to read verses 18 through 25. Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I want to come back to this verse, verse 18, because Paul has been talking to us about suffering. And we said that it was somewhat odd that Paul introduces suffering at this particular point uh, in Romans chapter 8, because this is a chapter about assurance. And suffering hardly seems to be an assuring concept. And yet Paul reminds us that it actually is. Um, He mentions it here because it is, of course, something that we all face at one point or another in our lives, and it was something that Jesus himself experienced during his life and during his ministry. But it was also the means by which Jesus glorified himself and glorified his Father. We talked about how he was suffering on the cross and following his suffering, and when he had expired there on Calvary, One of the Roman soldiers, seeing the way that Jesus did not denounce those who were mistreating him, seeing the way that Jesus endured the suffering and even prayed for those who were persecuting him when Jesus died, we're told that that Roman centurion cried out, surely this man was the Son of God. And the way that we deal with suffering in our life, as opposed to the way that the world often deals with suffering... You know, the world becomes angry when it suffers, or the world does everything in its power to avoid the prospect of suffering. But when as Christians we are realists and we recognize that storms will come into our lives, but we live in such a way that we're not angry, that we're not frustrated, but instead that we endure it patiently, knowing that God is working it for our good, well, then that can be a very powerful witness. And what's more, it is a testimony to the fact that we are sons and daughters of God. But we shouldn't think for one minute that Paul is simply saying, well, when trouble comes into your life, yes, there are opportunities for you to witness. But when all is said and done, the only thing you can do is grin and bear it. That's not what Paul is implying here. Just, you know, sort of stiff upper lip, you know, keep calm and carry on that sort of attitude. It's not stoicism that Paul is talking about here. Paul knows that that suffering can be difficult. Even if God can use it for his glory, and even God can use it for our benefit to shape us, to hone us ever more into the image of his son, Paul is not telling us that that means that suffering is pleasant. When suffering, difficulty, disappointment come into our lives, those things are not pleasant. And there's no one who's in their right mind who would seek them out. But, Paul says, when suffering does come, one way that we can endure it, one day that we can be more than conquerors, that's one expression that he uses, not just conquerors, but more than conquerors, 
One way we can do that is by remembering that the sufferings that we endure are momentary. They are momentary. He even describes them as slight in one place. Now, that doesn't mean that they're easy. He just means that they are temporary. Whatever we are going through, no matter how intense it may be, it can be a great comfort to know that this is not the end of the story. It does not end this way. There is something beyond the suffering, the pain, the misery, the agony, the disappointment, the frustration. And that's what he's talking about here in verse 18. Notice how he begins this verse. He says, for I consider. Some translations say, for I reckon. This is Paul's way of saying, I have considered this. I realize that suffering comes into my life. Paul knew this firsthand. All you have to do is read some of his letters, 2 Corinthians, for example, where he gives that whole catalog of things that he had gone through during his life and his ministry. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been beaten with rods. He'd been publicly flogged. He'd been in and out of prisons. Everything imaginable had happened to the Apostle Paul. He'd even been bitten by a venomous snake, which to me, of all the things, is the most terrifying. So Paul knew what suffering was. And Paul was no stoic. But he did have a way of getting through them. And that's what he's talking about here in Romans. He says, for I have thought about it. I know these things firsthand. But I have come to realize that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the what? The glory that is to be revealed. Whatever we're going through, Paul says... It cannot compare to the glory that you and I as believers, as sons and daughters of God, will one day experience with Christ. Now, that concept of glory, I think, is a difficult one for us to grasp. One commentator has said that this is perhaps one of the most difficult concepts for us to grasp. Because really, glory is something that is indescribable. I think this is one of the reasons why people struggle with heaven. Well, what is heaven going to be like? You know, if you've got a nice house on a deep water creek in the low country of South Carolina, it's hard to imagine heaven being any better than that. Let's be honest, when you live in such a beautiful place as Charleston, we often think, well, this is heaven. I mean, how could heaven be any better than this. This is, this is the sphere of our understanding. Let's be honest. This is what we have seen. This is what we know. It's hard to imagine something any better. And even the biblical writers sometimes struggle with this. I think this is why we struggle with the idea of heaven. What's heaven going to be like? You read in the book of Revelation how heaven is described as that place that has streets of gold and gates of pearl and precious gems and so forth, that place where there is no sun because the Lamb is the light. and it, It's a wonderful description, but you begin to realize that those are all symbols. None of that is meant to be taken literally, that heaven is actually paved with streets of gold and the gates are made of pearl. All of that is symbolic because it's trying to describe the indescribable. It's saying the things that are precious to us those things that we value, that we fight over, those things are commonplace in heaven. So even when heaven is described, it's described in symbol because you really can't even capture it. And when we're told that heaven will be a place where there's no suffering, there's no pain, where God himself is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, you'll notice that most of those things are negative. This is what heaven will not be like. But in terms of what heaven will be like, well, it's all done in symbol because it's such a hard concept for us to grasp. Well, I think that's true when it comes to glory. We have a hard time imagining what glory is going to be like. We know what the sufferings are like here. We experience them on a day-to-day -day basis. But what will glory be like? What is glory what is glory? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there are two words used in the Bible that are translated as glory. 
the Greek word in the New Testament is the word doxa, from which we get our term doxology, all right, glory. The other word is the Hebrew word kavod, kavod. And that Hebrew word is an interesting word. It means weightiness. That's what it means. It means weightiness, something that has weight, something that has substance. It's something that is approved. That's one of the reasons why gold is precious, is because gold has weight to it. It has substance to it. So in the Old Testament, when they talked about glory, they're talking about something of substance, something that is permanent, something that has value. But even that doesn't really get us close to the idea, does it? But here's the other word, and that is the word doxa. What does that mean? It literally means splendor or beauty. And we get just a picture of this, just a glimmer of this, or at least the disciples did, in Luke chapter 9. So keep your finger there in Romans and turn to Luke chapter 9. And Luke chapter 9 is describing, of course, the transfiguration. I preached on that not long ago. And let's just go ahead and read the first few verses, chapter 9, beginning at verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I answered the question, at least I think I answered the question, why was it that Jesus took these three men, Peter, John, and James, up on the mountain and not the rest of the other disciples, the other nine? Why didn't they get to go up there on the mountain and have this extraordinary experience? And I pointed out that I think one reason is because you'll remember that at the time of Jesus' trial in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was wrestling with the prospect of dying upon the cross within 24 hours, he took three of his disciples aside and asked them to pray with him that he might withstand this hour. And those three that he took aside with him were Peter, John, and James. Which means that those three men saw Jesus at his moment of greatest testing. I mean, right there, at the last minute, Jesus was asking the Father if there was any other way to save humanity, if there was any other way for the world to be delivered aside from this suffering, this misery that he was about to endure, he said, can it be? And, of course, God answered, no, it cannot be. That was not our agreed-upon plan. There is no other way. Jesus was in such torment over the prospect. We're told that he was actually sweating drops of blood. Incidentally, that's a real medical condition when people are in distress. And so I think it's because these three men saw Jesus at his lowest moment, at his moment of greatest testing. You know, after this point, Jesus was resigned to the cross. He had set his face, there was no turning back. But this was the moment. And so I think it's because these men saw Jesus in that moment of greatest weakness, he allowed them to come up on the mountain where they saw him in his, it says here, glory. And here we just get a picture of what that glory is. It's there in verse 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. One of the other versions of this says, as no fuller or bleach on earth could bleach them. There was an effulgence there was a majesty, there was a splendor about Jesus Christ. And that's an aspect of glory. So when Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory, that gives us just a taste of what we're talking about here. That there's going to come a time when you and I will have weight. We will have substance. We will be recognized. We will be acknowledged. You know, most people go through their lives longing to be noticed. 
even if you're an introvert. You want to be recognized as having value, as having importance. Now, you may not want a lot of attention on you, but you want to be recognized as someone who is of substance. And that's what Paul says. Most of us go through our lives trying to, to get that, trying to get approval. C.S. Lewis, back in 1940, delivered a sermon at St. Mary's Church in Oxford called The Weight of Glory. And he said, this is the longing of every human heart to be approved by God. And it's true. Most of us as children, sometimes even when we are adults, spend our lives longing for the approval of our parents, don't we? We work hard to get the approval of our parents, and that's a good thing. Children should long for the approval of their parents. They should long to hear those words, well done, my son, well done, my daughter. And many unhappy people go through their lives because they never got that from their parents, and they're still longing for it. Even after their parents have been in the grave for decades, they are still trying to live up to what was their parents' expectation. And Lewis says, we all long for that as well from God. We all long to hear from our Heavenly Father, well done, I see you, I recognize you, you are a person of substance. And Paul says, one day we will. We will experience that. We will no longer be shut out, we will be invited in to participate in him. We will be recognized as people of substance. And not only that, he says, but we will share in Christ's splendor, in his glory, in his beauty, in his majesty. We will share in all of those things. We will be made like unto him. We all long to be beautiful. Some people are more beautiful than others. Let's just go ahead and admit it. Most of us are average. Some of us just long to be above average. But one day we shall be truly beautiful as Christ is beautiful. That is the glory, Paul says, that awaits you and me. It's a glory, incidentally, that we once had. You know, talking to people who have lived in Charleston their whole life. In fact, I was doing that just yesterday. I was with two men who grew up in Charleston, and they were talking about the old days. And they were talking about all the things that they did, and they were talking about how the city was and so forth. Those of you who've been around here for some time, you've seen from some pretty dramatic changes. And, and many of you probably think that a lot of those changes are not necessarily for the good. They've ruined our city. Okay, well, I understand. That's not the point I'm trying to make, incidentally, but I understand that. But there is a longing, there is a nostalgia, isn't there? There's, there's a longing for the, the days of Arcadia, for, for the way things were. You know, there is a sense in which, as human beings, we have that same sense of longing. Lewis, in that essay, says we all long for the glory that we once had. Now you say, well, what kind of glory was that? What he's talking about is the glory that mankind once had at the very beginning. It's the glory that Adam and Eve once had. Turn to Genesis chapter 1 for just a minute, and let's take a look at the creation of man. We're going to come back to Genesis if we have the time today. But you go back to Genesis chapter 1, and it's... It's really helpful to see how it is that God creates and what he does in the creation. We're told that God creates the world and after each successive act of creation, God pronounces a blessing on it. He says, what I've made is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. But of course, the pinnacle of God's creative activity is mankind. Verse 26, Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. What is the glory of mankind according to Genesis chapter 1? It is that we have been made in the image of God. Man, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. They reflected God's splendor, His glory. Now, I want to point out to you that they did not have a glory like unto God's glory. They were still creatures. They were only a pale reflection. But it was nevertheless in God's image. It was glory. Now, you and I are made in the image of God as well, but as a consequence of the fall, that image has been severely marred. You understand that? We, we are not what we once were. And there is within all of us a, a longing to be like that again. I, I don't know what Adam and Eve really looked like, those first hominids or whatever they were, when God bestowed upon them his divine image. I don't know exactly what they look like, but I always imagine them to be perfect specimens. Like Michelangelo's David. Absolutely perfect in every respect. You know, sometimes I look back at pictures that people will send me from when I was young, and I look at it, and then I look at myself now, and I think, oh, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> you know, we're not. For all of us, it's a case of diminishing returns, and we have this longing to be what we once wanted, to have the glory that we once had. And I think there is that desire on all of us as human beings to go back, but we realize that it is gone. You know, the movie Gone with the Wind is really a great movie. I know it's not historically accurate. I know that, but it's still fun. And, of course, what's so powerful about that movie is Scarlet Longing. She remembers those days back before the war, back before the burning, back before all of that when everything was glorious and beautiful. And now she's dealing at the end of all of that with what? With loss. And there's this nostalgic longing for what we once had. Well, the promise is that we will have it again, but we do not have it now. Right now, we have Ichabod. And I'm not talking about Ichabod Crane. <laughs> the word Ichabod in the Old Testament means the glory has departed. That's what the word means. Never name your child Ichabod. That's a terrible name. But that's what the word means. In the Old Testament, the word Ichabod means the glory has departed. And, of course, the glory has departed from us, and we long to have it back again. And what Paul is saying is that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will one day be restored to us. But it's not just that we're going to get the glory back. We're going to get something else. We're going to get a glory that surpasses even the glory that was known to Adam and Eve. As I said, they had a kind of glory, but it was not like God's glory. What Adam and Eve had was innocence. They had innocence. And innocence is a beautiful thing. You know, you see children, and there's an innocence about them. But then you meet somebody who's lived a hard life. Isn't that sometimes the way we describe it? We sometimes say, oh, he was ridden hard and put up wet. And we know what that means, don't we? We means that they have ridden, they have had a hard life. They've lived a, a hard life, a fast life maybe. They've done their own thing. They've lived a wild existence and, and you look at them when they were children, you knew them when they were young, and they were fresh face, and everything was hopeful, and now you look at them and you realize that time has taken its toll, and life has taken its toll, and you recognize that what? The glory has departed. Well, Adam and Eve had a kind of innocence, but as a consequence of the fall, it departed. That little glimmer of glory that they once had, it, it departed. And here we are, thousands upon thousands of generations later, 
sin piled on high, one after the other, and we realize that it is true, Ichabod, the glory has departed from us. But the promise is that God is going to give us back that innocence, and not just the innocence, but we're going to be made like, not unto Adam and Eve, but like unto Jesus Christ. It will be that which surpasses even the glory that they had. Glory upon glory. We have a great hymn that puts this well. Where he displays his healing power, death and the curse are known no more. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. That is the hope that we have as Christians. And Paul wants us to understand that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing they're not worth comparing with what will one day be ours, the glory that will be revealed. Uh, it's very interesting that phrase, not worth comparing, comes from the Greek. It is a verb, axios or ego. It means to drive, to lead, or to cause to move. It means, as I said, something of substance, something that is weightiness. It's so weighty that it actually by the sheer power of its weight, moves. Sort of like a car parked on an incline. You can park a, a bicycle on an incline and it's not going anywhere. You park an, a, a car on the incline, you don't put or engage the, the parking brake. The, the car, by its sheer weight, can begin to move, can it? And, and that's what this means. And what Paul is saying is the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing. There is a sense in which the glory is so weighty that it actually moves. The idea here is of, and Paul says you put on one side of the scale all the sufferings of this present time. But on the other side you put the glory. And he said, compared to the glory which is weighty, which is powerful, which is splendorous, in comparison, he said, well, there is none. There is no comparison. And that's why, as I said, he begins this section by saying, I consider. I have thought about it. I realize that, yes, the pain of the present time is difficult, but when you put it in the scale over and against the glory, it cannot even move the scale. And it is us in the midst of this is that we should keep our eyes on the prize. That when we're going through tough times, when we're experiencing disappointments, when we have had loss in our lives, don't focus on that. But focus on the end of the story. Focus on the glory that is one day going to be yours. A glory that is greater than the one that your father Adam lost. Glory upon glory. Skip ahead toward the end of the New Testament. And let's take a look at 1 John for just a minute. First John chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Remember, that's what Paul is talking about, being children of God, the assurance. John's talking about the same thing. He says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That's John's way of saying, you're going to go through tough times. The light came into the world, and the world tried to extinguish the light. He came to that which was his own, but his own received him not. The reason why the world does not know us or accept us is that it did not know him nor accept him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. That should be a great encouragement to you and to me when the storms come into our lives, when the wind begins to blow and the water seems as though it's up to our necks. 
Remember that the sufferings of this present time are momentary. They are slight by comparison. doesn't mean that they're easy. just means they're slight by comparison with the glory, the weightiness, the splendor that will one day be revealed to us. So keep your eyes fixed on the prize. Now, Paul then goes on in verse 20, and that's where we're going to go now, to talk about how it's not just we ourselves who long for this glory. It's not just us who have been through difficult times who have grown inwardly and long to be what we were intended to be. He says the whole world is groaning for our redemption. The whole world is groaning for our glorification. Look at how he puts it. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There is a glory that even the creation longs for. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? That here we are as human beings, we're the pinnacle of God's creative activity, and we have fallen from grace. Ichabod, the glory has departed from us, and there is that nostalgic feeling within us, this longing to be better than we are, to be like unto Christ, what we were created to be when we were made in the image of God, undefiled, unmarred. We long for that, and we can understand why we long for that. But Paul is saying it's not just us. The whole of the creation is groaning. The whole of creation is longing that this will happen to you and to me. Now, that's really pretty extraordinary. The whole of creation wants us to be redeemed and glorified. For the whole creation, he says, groans inwardly. What is Paul talking about here when he says all of creation groans? Well, I want to really pick this apart a little bit so that we can begin to understand um, our duty as Christians in terms of the creation around us, but also in terms of the effects of the fall, not only upon us, but upon the world around us. And this is, I think, very important because I think there are a lot of wrong ideas. I think some of that is due to the fact that we don't always read the text carefully and I want to show us how if we read the text carefully, we come to perhaps an altogether new understanding of some things that we thought we knew, but perhaps did not. In order to do this, in order to understand why it is that Paul says the whole creation groans, and you'll notice that he connects the groaning of creation with our fallen state and the longing of creation for glory to our glorification. That is to say that whatever happens to us directly affects the world around us. It does not just affect us, it has affected the whole cosmos. That, that's how disastrous the fall was. It's not just that it separated us from God. There was, as it were, a great fault that was sent through the whole of the created order. The world has gone off kilter, and it will never be made right. The whole world, the whole cosmos, until you and I are redeemed and experience the glory that is ours in Christ. In order to understand this, because it's a big concept, we need to go back to Genesis. So go back to Genesis chapter 1. If you want to know where Genesis is, most of you know it's the first book of the Bible. That's what it means, Genesis beginnings. Genesis is one of those foundational books. There are certain books that I always want to teach when I go into a parish. I always want to teach Romans for the obvious reasons. It's the constitution of Christianity. I always want to teach the Gospel of John because it is the highest theology that we have anywhere in the New Testament. I always love to teach Ephesians because it's just my favorite book of the Bible. 
I love to teach the book of Acts because Acts is not only a record of the early church, it is a blueprint for how you and I are to do ministry today. But the other book that I love to teach, and you can realize I have to be at a, in a parish for a very long time at the rate that we go. So if any of you are hoping that I'm leaving anytime soon, probably not until the Lord comes again in glory. So at any rate, one of the other books that I love is Genesis because it's so foundational. The New Testament tells us what the cure is. Genesis tells us what the disease is. It tells us what has gone wrong. It tells us why the world is the way that it is. Let me tell you why I love Genesis in particular. Some years ago, when I was um, in Beaufort, um, this is just a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, um, Kristen and I were um, coming back with our children from Savannah. Um, when you wanted to go to the big city, you went to one of two places. You went to Charleston or you went to Savannah from Beaufort. So we went down to Savannah for the day. We were coming back into town. It was a Saturday. And as we're making our way back into town, we found that almost every road had been blocked by police. Police everywhere. Blue lights everywhere. And traffic was backed up, and they were just letting one, two, three cars through at a time. Finally, I got up to where the police officer was directing traffic, and I said, you know, we live in Beaufort. We're, we're trying to get into town. And uh, I said, what, what's the problem? Well, it was the weekend of the air show where they bring in all the Navy pilots and the Marine pilots, and in particular, the Blue Angels. Now, you know who the Blue Angels are? They are the, the, the special, you know, flyers, Navy flyers, who do all those extraordinary maneuvers and so forth. And it was the weekend of the air show. Because everybody's coming into town, you know, when you're a local, you leave. So that's what we had done. We'd gone to Savannah for the day. We're coming back, all these blue lights everywhere, and he said, one of the Blue Angels has crashed. And, uh, of course, they had uh, the pilot um, crash the plane right in the presence of all these people who were watching this air show, and he died. And, of course, what has to happen is that the government then has to do a whole series of investigations as to why this was. So you, you don't find out, you know. I mean, none of us have heard anything about the Chinese spy balloon lately, have we? Um, we, we don't know, and when they'll, they'll tell us when they're ready. And that's the, sort of the way it was with this blue angel. So eventually we got home. It was several months before we found out what the problem was. And they said that it was a case of pilot error. Specifically, the pilot had experienced what is known as spatial displacement. Now what that means, and this can happen to a pilot, not just in that kind of a plane, but in any kind of a plane, it's a case where you experience extreme g-force and you black out momentarily and you come through that you can you can come back maybe just within seconds but you are confused momentarily as to, to what has happened to you uh, it can also happen to commercial pilots when they go through a, a terrible storm or they experience extreme turbulence um, what happens is that a pilot can become so confused, spatial displacement, that they actually think they're flying right side up when in fact they are inverted and they're flying upside down. And that's what had happened to this pilot. He'd experienced G-forces, he's going through all these maneuvers, and when he suddenly came to, he thought that he was right side up when he was upside down, he pulled back on the stick, and instead of going up, he went down and had no time to recover and crash the plane. Now, when a pilot experiences spatial displacement, it is grilled into them, drilled into them, that they should not trust their own feelings. You must always fly by the instrument panel. Don't look at anything around you. Look at the instrument panel. You can trust the instrument panel. It will tell you regardless of how you feel, what is reality? Well, I want to suggest to you that Genesis is like an instrument panel. I want to suggest to you that you and I are living in a world in which there are so many forces that are coming against us that we have experienced a kind of spiritual 
displacement. We think that we're living in a right-side-up world, but I want to suggest to you that we are living in a world that has been turned upside down. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1, isn't it? He said when you get to the bottom of that downward spiral, you're at a place where you're calling evil good and good evil, and you're actually celebrating and inventing ways of doing evil. That is not a right-side-up world. That's an upside-down world. And when you experience that kind of spiritual displacement, what you need is an instrument panel. And that's what Genesis provides us with. Genesis is your instrument panel to tell you why the world is the way that it is and point you toward the only solution to it. So I love the book of Genesis. So let's go ahead and take a look just briefly at the instrument panel in the time that we have remaining. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that when God created, and by the way, let me just say something about this. I do not believe for one minute that Genesis is making a commentary on how God created. So I do not get into the creation evolution debate. I don't think that the author of Genesis is concerned in the least with the mechanism that God used to create. Genesis is concerned with the agency. Not with how God created, but with the fact that God did. As it was, was intended by God to be good. And God looks at what he's made and he's pleased. Now we have to ask that question, what does good mean? And I say we have to ask that question because I think many people, when they think a good creation, that means a perfect creation. That's what we think of, isn't it? When you think of God looking at creation and it's good, it means it's perfect. Perfect. That is not necessarily so. But that is not necessarily so. When God looks at creation, he says it's good, it means it's good to him. It means it's good for his purpose. So, for example, if you were to go to my wife and say, I am going to give you a free vacation for two weeks. You get to choose to go wherever you want. What is a good vacation to you? She's going to say, I want to go and sit on the beach and bake like a potato. <laughs> if, she's, if they say to me, I want to give you two weeks, and you can go anywhere you want to go, and it's going to be a good vacation for you, I'm going to be on a Civil War battlefield, I can tell you right now. What's good to me is not necessarily good to her. If somebody gives you $5 million and said, go build the house of your dreams, Mr. Warlick will be your architect, go find the house, build the house of your dreams, Somebody is going to go out there and say, I want Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Which I think is one of the ugliest houses in the world. It's a beautiful setting. But a good house to me would be a beautiful 18th century Georgian. See, good is a subjective term. Well... When God says that the creation is good, it means that he looked on it and it was good to him. It was good in terms of what he meant it to accomplish. It does not necessarily mean that it was perfect. It does not necessarily mean that there was no death and decay prior to the fall of the animal world. When it talks about the curse of death coming upon man, it means just that. Death came upon man. It doesn't say anything else about the creation before that. When God said to Adam, if you eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. If there was no death up to this point, Adam wouldn't even have known what death was. He wouldn't have had a reference point. So we need to understand that when Genesis says God made the world and it was good, it was good for God. It was good for what he intended it to be. And of course, the pinnacle 
of God's creative activity is man, who has been made in his image. And who we're told, once man is created, is given the job of what? Reigning over creation and subduing it. Subduing it. In other words, there was a kind of beauty to the creation, but there was a wildness to the creation as well. And it became the responsibility of man to what? To subdue that, to bring order out of that chaos. You might buy a piece of property and you build your house on it and it's kind of wild all around and you take that wildness and you turn it into a beautiful garden. There is a sense in which that's what you and I were called to do. That was our vocation. We were to extend the blessings of Eden. We're going to talk about that in a minute. God takes man and puts him in a garden. And he gives them the job of saying, here's what it should look like. That's what it does look like. Here's what it should like. And that's your job, man. That's your job, woman, to go out there and extend the blessings of this beauty to the whole of the creation. That's man's vocation. We are called to be God's regent. It is a great honor. We are second in the whole of creation to God alone. But you know what the old poem says, it takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. <laughs> Mankind is not satisfied with being number two. We want to be number one. I want to be God. And so we rebel. And there is a failure. Chapter 3, Genesis. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. This is how I know that creation, while it was good, may not have been perfect in our eyes. There's a snake in the garden. And you know how I feel about snakes. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was the great sin of Eden, not that they ate of a particular fruit. They ate of the fruit that was forbidden because they wanted to be like God. And folks, that is the root of all sin. To be God means that you're in charge. You're the master of your own fate. You're the captain of your own destiny. And that's what we all want to be. I don't want to be second best. This is a good job that God has given Adam and Eve. This is this beautiful garden. It is magnificent. And they have a job to do. And it's a wonderful job. It can be a pleasing job to take the beauty of Eden and extend it to the whole of creation. But they're not happy with being regents. They want to be the ruler. And so what happens is that we are told that mankind falls and a curse comes upon the creation. Let's take a look at it. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth your children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. What is the curse? Well... Part of the curse, we're told, is that the creation itself, the land, is cursed because of what Adam has done. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat your bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, sometimes what we think is that as a result of the curse something dramatic happened in the created order. 
That is to say, God cursed the land because of what Adam had done, and all these terrible things began to occur, like noceums suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And we all know they are a curse. But all of a the sudden, they appeared out of nowhere. And, and all of a the sudden, there were earthquakes, and there were tornadoes, and tsunamis, and that was the result. And that's why the creation groans, Paul says, and God's going to set all of that road right, and it's going to be idyllic again. Well, as we've already seen, we don't know that it was idyllic to begin with, at least according to our standards. It was good. But I don't think that what Genesis is teaching is that the creation itself suddenly changed and cockroaches appeared out of nowhere. I don't think that's what it's teaching us. If you read the text closely, you get a very different picture. First of all, as I said, the world was, it may have been somewhat beautiful, but it was a sort of wild beauty. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, Listen to what it says, and listen carefully to what it says. And God planted a garden in Eden. It's there in verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, which means there is the creation, but God, in the midst of that creation, does what? Plants a garden. A garden that is distinct from everything else around it. And in the east, and there he put a man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. And it goes on and on and on, and then it says, And the Lord God, verse 15, took the man and put him in the garden. Now I want you to notice that. That means that Adam was formed of the dust of the earth, but the dust of the earth that he was formed from was what? Outside the garden. He takes the man and puts him in the garden. All right? So he hadn't been created in the garden. He was created of the dust of the earth and put in the garden. So that's the first thing. God plants a garden. What is a garden? It is a place where there is order. It is a place of beauty. And it was man's job to take what he saw in the garden and extend it to creation. When man sins, part of the curse is that man is driven what? Out of the garden. Out of the garden. And we're told that a cherubim was placed there at the entrance to the garden with a flaming sword so that mankind would not have access to the garden or to the tree of life because now in his fallen state, if he had access to the tree of life, which is kind of a sacrament which gives him eternal life, he would live forever in his fallen state. So he can no longer have access to that tree. He's outside the garden. And it's outside the garden, we're told, where thorns and thistles are located. Not in the garden, outside the garden. Which means that outside the garden becomes the arena in which God is going to discipline man. And in the end, he will return, because he no longer has access to the tree of life, he will return to the dust from which he came, which was the dust outside the garden. So God expels man from the garden, and it's out there, outside the garden, without access to the tree of life, where things are wild, where there are thorns and thistles, that man will live his days contending with the ground. By the sweat of his brow, he will eat his bread until he dies. Well, when Paul says, all of creation moans for our redemption you begin to understand what he's really talking about there in Romans. It's not as though the world is suddenly changed because man did something wrong. It's because man did something wrong and we have not lived up to our high calling 
to live as image bearers of God and extend the blessings to Eden that the whole creation moans now. There's no garden. Ichabod, the glory of the garden, has departed. Do you know what happens when you don't tend a garden? You know what happens. That is what has happened to the world. I'll give you a, a visual picture of this. One of my favorite artists. I'm a big fan of the Hudson River School. I'm a romantic. So Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt, these are my great artists. You know, I, modern art does nothing. It's lost on me. I've got to be honest with you. It's complete. We went some years ago to Ireland, and we visited one of the great stately homes outside of Dublin called Castletown. If you ever go to Dublin, go and visit Castletown. It's a magnificent, great Irish pile, magnificent Georgian house, filled with the most beautiful Chippendale furniture you cannot imagine. And they had taken down all of the beautiful artwork to put up a modern art exhibition. And I'm not kidding you, I could have done a better job with a crayon. <laughs> and they're selling this stuff for $100,000. And people are buying it. It just goes to show you how upside down the world really is. So I'm a big fan of the Hudson River School, that great romantic school, and one of my favorite artists is Thomas Cole. And Thomas Cole did a series of paintings that I think capture what Genesis is showing us, our instrument panel, and what Paul is talking about. The first painting is called Eden. Eden. Now look at what Thomas Cole has done there. I think he really read the scripture closely. You've got this beautiful, majestic scene, but you, you can see there are trees and there are vines and there is sort of this untamed wilderness. But if you look inside, you can see this cleared area. There is a garden. And if you look even closer, and unfortunately sort of washed out in the light, there is a man and a woman there who have been placed in the garden. Now, what happens when man is cursed? We're told that he is driven out of the garden. Well, Thomas Cole did a painting of that as well. So keep this one in your mind, and then take a look at this next one. It's called Expulsion from the Garden. Look to the right of the screen. What do you see? You see a garden, and they're being driven out out of the garden, sort of across the land bridge into the rest of the creation, which is dark. It's not entirely ugly, but it is dark. It is wild. It is untamed. Well, I want you to think about what we as human beings who were called to extend the blessings of Eden to the whole of the created order I want you to think what has happened now that we have not fulfilled our duty, our obligation, our high calling of, as Christians. Why does the creation moan and groan and travail, longing for us to be redeemed and restored so that we can carry on the work we were originally called to do? I'll show you what we have done to the world. This is what we have done to the world. And do you wonder why the creation groans as in travail, longing for redemption? We have ruined what God has made. And we have failed to extend the blessings and turn the world into a garden. And in so doing, we are killing ourselves. And so what Paul is talking about is God getting the Adam project back on track. That's why Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. The first Adam failed, but a new one has come. And by his death, by his resurrection, has created a new race of people. A new race to do 
what the original race failed to do. Do you understand that your end, my friends, is not heaven? That is not what the New Testament teaches. When you die and go to heaven, heaven is not your final destination. What the New Testament talks about, what the book of Revelation talks about, is a new heaven and a new earth in which God will remake everything as it was intended to be. And you and I will be given back our original calling and vocation. We will be given the task of extending the blessings of Eden to the whole of creation. And God shall reign over all things. It's much bigger, my friends, than getting your ticket punched than going to heaven when you die. So Paul says, it's not just we ourselves who groan. The whole of creation groans as in travail, longing for our redemption, longing for the restoration of the glory. Let us pray. Father, your plans are always so much bigger than we can even begin to imagine. And we do, we groan inwardly. Help us to realize that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing.